brief introduction to type theory. Okay. Um, so first, let's go back to the origins of deduction. So the idea of a formal approach to deductive logic using uh, formal reasoning and a sort of mechanistic approach really goes back to at least Aristotle, possibly before, but he was one of the, the first to really put forward principles that we have now. So he said, a deduction is speech in which certain things having been supposed, something different from those supposed results of necessity because of their being so. Yeah, Aristotle was pretty confusing, but what did he mean when he was saying this? Essentially, if we have uh, that all A's are B's, all B's are C's, we can derive that all A's are C's, okay? So the things that were supposed were A's or B's, B's or C's, and we've derived me mechanically that all A's are C's, even though it was not one of the supposed things. So, th so that's basically what he meant by a, a system of deduction. Okay, so type theory is entirely about mechanistic reasoning following from some number of antecedents to some number of conclusions or consequences. Okay, so this, the entire structure of a type is basically some antecedents, a rule that we use, that we apply, and we'll put the rule name on the right, and then the consequence is, is derived. Okay, so Aristotle's deduction that was given above would be written in this way. So all, all A's are B's, all B's are C's, therefore all A's are C's. And we, we could think of this as all dogs are mammals, all mammals are animals, therefore all d animal dogs are animals. Okay, so type theory itself is a foundation for mathematics. In that sense it's like category theory or set theory. Uh, and the basic building block is the inference rule, whereas in, in set theory it would be the set, and in category theory it would be categories and arrows and objects. So the advantage, the basic advantage of type theory is that the only thing that we talk about is our method of reasoning. We don't have any fundamental building blocks like sets or arrows or objects everything that we talk about is is really just syntax and our methodology for applying rules of deduction so it's it's kind of nice as a foundation for that reason it's quite flexible and it's highly syntactic which is an advantage when it comes to computers because they really are uh, can't have any notion of s semantics except that which we we try to imbue them with okay so I'll just give a brief example of uh, an introduction, a rule that we might apply um, mechanically. So if we have an implication, we can read this as A implies B. Together with a proof that A exists, then we can derive B. Okay? So we have an implication, a proposition, and then our consequent. And that's called modus ponens, and it's actually w w something that uh, Aristotle used in his syllogistic logic. Okay, so a brief aside on formal reasoning using type theory. Um, there's what kinds of rules we're allowed to apply is somewhat arbitrary. We can make them up as we go along, and in fact, there's lots of different type systems. There's ITT and UTP and you know ETT and OTT and all kinds of different uh, type systems. There's no golden ro road to formal deduction. So how do we know if we have a good system? Well, there's a couple of sort of uh, key factors that we, we can use as a benchmark. One of them is soundness. And basically what that means is if we can prove A, we shouldn't be allowed to prove not A. Or alternatively, we shouldn't be able to prove anything at all. So if we can prove everything, it's not a very good formal system. Now, well, that that has to come with some caveats. You actually can have type systems, and in fact they're widely used in which you can prove anything, and they are still useful, oddly enough, but if you want to be careful about um, using them as a logic, you probably don't want that feature. So we can relax this notion, I mean, paraconsistent logics, they have, you know, you can prove A and not A and be okay, and uh, and there's other ways around it, but we won't worry about that for now. 
The other big one that was historically considered important for a logic was completeness. Uh, but Gödel sort of shot that one out of the water. So we're not going to actually be that worried about completeness. Uh, it has a bunch of, of um, problems. And we'll talk about that at the end. Okay. So what are we going to use as a philosophical guide to make our, our inference rules? Well, we want a computational logic. So we want a logic that's actually going to mesh nicely with the idea of, of computability and uh, compute, computational feasibility. And we can use that. that it turns out, oddly enough, that uh, taking that as a guide is pretty much the same as what, and what was the intuitionistic or constructive schools of mathematics and logic. And uh, they actually sort of, even before computers were a major feature, they already had sort of invented uh, the kind of logic that we're going to be using. Uh, yeah, we don't have to worry too much about local completeness and global soundness. So I'll actually skip that. I won't put that in here. So the guide that we use where we connect logic with computation is called the Curry-Howard co correspondence. And schematically, it says that every proposition or predicate that we have is going to be um, a type. Our proofs are going to be considered to be identical to program terms or programs, if you want to think of them as programs. So a program is, in fact, a proof of some type. And computation features in as normalization. So our notion of when two proofs are the same is actually going to be connected very closely to our notion of computation. And we'll see that later. OK. So uh, a brief aside about classical logic and why we're using intuitionistic logic. Um, well, the problem with classical logic is that there are statements, logical statements, that can be made in classical logic that have no obvious computational meaning. So A or not A is always true for any A. But it's very hard to think about like how you could have a principle that's true of all objects, whether or not they exist and still have it have computational meaning. So some people have made forays into that direction, but I, I won't go into those. Um, and it, there, it's not straightforward if you do try to apply some computational principle. So classical logic isn't bad in the sense that it's unsound, but it's, it, it sort of uh, violates our, our idea of having a logic that's connected to computation. OK, so an example, there we can read this. There exists an x such that p holds of x. Or there does not exist an x such that p holds of x. So there exists a unicorn which is alive, or there does not exist a unicorn which is alive. But we're here we're talking about uh, existentials. They're saying that they exist, but you can't ever even have a unicorn. So there's no actual witness to this statement. So it's sort of a, a ridiculous you know, I mean, it's it's almost an absurdity. You're you're reasoning about a universe in which you can't actually present any of the uh, potential objects that you're saying have some property p. Okay, so the basic problem with classical logic is that it it allows reasoning without any evidence at all, and we're going to take a much more evidential approach to logic. Okay. Our connectives. Uh, OK, so we're going to make a simple theory of types first, a, a propositional logic. So it's identical to the first order propositional logic without, without variables at the predicate level. And we say that a type, which we'll denote as A or B, is formed from atomic propositions, disjunctions, so A or B, conjunctions, A and B, or implications, A implies B. OK, so the way that we work with these is with formation rules and elimination rules. So a conjunction, we can introduce a proof of an A and B by having an A and a B. So if we can derive A and we can derive B, then we can derive A and B. And our rule is written on the right-hand side here. And we just this is just the name of our rule. So we call it uh, 
and introduction or conjunction introduction. Okay, so then we have an elimination rule. And the elimination rule says that if we have a proof of A and B, we can get back an A. Okay. And then we have another symmetric elimination rule for the other side where we can get back a B if we have an A and a B. Now, we're going to tie this to our computation by having a term, and we're going to have the term with its type on the right-hand side. So instead of just having propositions, we're going to interpret that as a type, and then we're going to have the program term on the left-hand side. So here we have x is of type A, y is of type B, then we can form a pair, a pair type, of type A and B. Okay, so this is just like tuples or pairing that you might have in a programming language. It's exactly the same. Okay, and then we'll, we'll have two projections. Uh, and this basically just destructures a pair and will return, in this case, the first part of the pair. So if you have a pair of an A and a B, then you can get uh, the first element of the pair and it'll be of type A. Or you can get the second element of the pair and it'll be of type B. Okay, we could have written the pair here as x comma y, but it may be a free variable, so we might, may not be able to destructure it. So we do need this uh, projection operator. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Implication introduction is is as follows. So uh, we can derive an A implies B if we can use a proof of A to derive a proof of B. Okay. So this dot, dot, dot signifies any number of proof steps. And in fact, A could be used multiple times in the proof of B. Uh, but if we can do that, then we can discharge A, what we say discharge. We can make a function uh, from an A to a B by, by uh, capturing the free variable A and putting it into a binding. And we'll see that in a second. OK. So elimination is just function application. We'll, we say that A implies B together with an A. We can get a B. OK. So in our term calculus, we'll write an anonymous function as the introduction uh, for implication. And what that does is it says that those occurrences of A that we used are going to be called variables inside of the body R. So R is the body of our function x of type A is our, our uh, formal parameter. And we can use inside of R, we can use x any number of times inside of this term OR. And if we can derive that OR has type B, then we know that we have a function from an A to a B. OK, is everything clear so far? Yeah. 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 OK, cool. OK. Similarly, our, our elimination rule is that we apply uh, the function s to an argument r, and we'll get back a b. So this is the application of a function to an argument. So you could say this could be f, and this x, this is f of x, or in this case, s of r. OK, so an example really quickly of uh, implication introduction. So if, if we have a, a polynomial in which x is a number, we need x to be a number for this sentence to make sense, then uh, we can derive that x squared plus 1 is a polynomial, right? So we can make a function out of it by, by saying that we'll bind the free parameter x, which exists in this body of this function here, uh, and we'll, we'll make it a parameter so that we can take any number and we'll return a polynomial by replacing the formal parameter x in the body with whatever number you give us. OK? OK, so disjunction. Uh, we, we also want to be able to inject into uh, two possible types, which may be dissimilar. And we can do that by, um, by disjunction introduction. So if we have an A, we can say, well, we can weaken the type and say, well, an A can be either an A or a B. And this is sometimes useful when we want to, like, there's lots of uses of things like this. If you want to have um, a maybe type where something doesn't necessarily return a value, then you could say that it's A or fail or something like that, or A or, you know, 
error message. So it could be an error type or something like that. So we can weaken a type by, by adding in another possibility. So you can introduce a B, supposing it was an error type and B is an error, then you can inject it into the A or B type by using this uh, introduction 2. So the first one is in introduction 1, second one is introduction 2, just means on the left or the right. Now the elimination uh, principle is a little bit complicated. Uh, there's this C here, which doesn't appear anywhere else, which is a little bit odd, perhaps. But basically what we're saying is that, well, actually, I'll, I'll fast forward past this elimination principle to the term calculus, because it's actually easier to understand from the terms. Okay. So our two terms that we use to introduce into a disjunction are in left and in right. And they basically just say if we're in the left half of the type, or in the right half of the type. Okay, so if uh, it wasn't an error, then we put it in left and it's an A, and if it was an error, we could put it into the error type by saying, actually, this is our error message, and we stick it into, into A or B. Now, the elimination principle, what it does is essentially, since A or B could be either an A or a B, we have to have some way of dealing with it whether it's an A or a B. So we can get back to some arbitrary type C that's symmetric for both by using a function F from A to C and a function G from B to C. And what that means is that we can handle the condition where it's not an error or the condition where it is an error. So if B was an error and A was, for instance, uh, an OK response message or something like that, then this would say, this is what we do in the case that it's OK and G is what we do in the case that it's a failure. And we can apply the combination of those two different cases as a term. We say that we combine F and G and apply it to O. Okay, so it's a sort of case analysis of which one, if we were in left or whether we were in right. Okay. Okay. So that's, so what we've actually invented here is uh, is actually the simply typed lambda calculus with sums and products, but it's also there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between our terms and predicate lo or uh, propositional logic. So this propositional logic and the lambda calculus are actually really, really closely um, coupled, and it's actually it was kind of weird when when it was found out that that was the case, but we're still missing some features. So every, every term here corresponds with the proof, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence with, between program terms and proofs, and we can construct the one from the other. But we don't have any computation yet. Uh, that's still missing from our system. So the way we add that is we do so by looking at what proofs we want to have equivalent. And it turns out that just looking at the lambda calculus's notion of... Uh, of evaluation gives us a really good way of thinking about which proofs should be equivalent. Okay, so quickly, the lambda calculus. So we'll say that x and y are variables, and terms will have r, s, and t are terms, and terms are formed by the following grammar. So they're either a variable, a pair, a projection uh, into the first projection or the second projection, an injection into a sum type in left, uh, uh, an injection into a disjunction uh, in left or in right, or um, an application of a case elimination or, uh, or a disjunction elimination, which is right there. Okay. And we need a notion of substitution, uh, and that allows us to deal with variables. Okay. So the way we do substitution is if we have a variable x, we say that if x is equal to y from a substitution y to r, then we replace x with r. Otherwise, we just leave x alone. If we're a lambda form, things are a little bit more complicated. Uh, since this is the, the formal parameter for a function where x is in s, we have to be careful that we don't uh, misinterpret x if it's the same as y. So 
we can bring the substitution inside of the binding as long as X is always chosen fresh with respect to Y and R. Okay, and so an example of this. So if X is a number and we're looking at polynomials, then here we have X is bound as a formal parameter to this function and we don't want to confuse it with this X. So this X on the outside is referring to any free X's that are bound from the outside environment. So in that case, we actually have to rename the formal parameter so that, and then we can bring the substitution inside and not, uh, not ruin the, the, uh, the functional nature of this uh, form. Okay, another example, Y here is not bound. It doesn't exist as a formal parameter. It's actually referring to a free variable. So we can directly bring the substitution inside. We don't have to do any renaming. So we're just worried about whether or not it's a formal parameter of a lambda form or not. Okay. Okay. So um, for pairs, you can just bring the substitution into each uh, term of the pair. And for projections, you can just bring it in. Same for pi 1 and pi 2. And same, same goes for in left and in right injections. And for case as well. You can just bring it right in. OK. So computation. So there's a, in the lambda calculus, computation is completely just beta reduction. And what that means is that you, we replace formal parameters with terms. So here in this example, we'll replace every occurrence of x in the term s with the term r. So going back to our example, we have some polynomial x squared plus 1 with a formal parameter x. We can replace that with 2 in the following way. So we apply it to 2, and then it becomes x is replaced with 2, and then it's 2 squared plus 1. And that's, that's beta reduction. OK. Uh, the identity function is another example. So we apply r to x. Uh, we apply r to this lambda form. And that just replaces every occurrence of x in the body with or, which in this case, since the body is just x, it just gives back r. So it's an identity function because whatever you apply it to, it just returns it. OK, so now this, this is actually really interesting because what this uh, reduction is doing is it's simplifying our proofs. OK, so if we have, um, in this case here, we have a, a deduction of a b, and down here we also have a deduction of a b. But here we have an intermediate, and here the intermediate is that a implies b and an a, and then we get back to b. So there's some kind of diversion that we've taken here, and that diversion is computation. It can be eliminated through computation. Okay, so what we do is we replace every occurrence of x in uh, x of type A in the body of S with R of type A. Now you can, you can play with this yourself, but th the fact is that any proof of S of type B that only relies on X being of type A allows you to replace any other proof of A in for X because X has no structure. It's just a variable. So because we can do that, we can eliminate it and we can just go straight to using or instead of every, every branch that uses x, we just use an or proof. And then we can use that to derive s, where every occurrence of x is replaced with or at type b. OK? So that's beta reduction. And this, this notion of proof equivalence is where the computation takes place. OK. So we can, we can, replace, we can repeat this same game. And the game is essentially you have, um, you have a type then you have an elimination that can take place. So we'd repeat the same beta reduction trick for all of our eliminations which are pi 1, pi 2 and case elimination and we'd have a whole bunch of intermediate proof steps that can be removed and that process is called proof normalization. So proof normalization is actually the same thing as uh, computation in the in the lambda calculus at least. 
Okay. So, <laughs> what's the point in all this? We're dealing with propositional calculus, which isn't really all that interesting. I mean, we can talk about, you know, strings, numbers, booleans, and stuff like that. But it's not a very rich logic. It's actually quite simple. And the lambda calculus, you wouldn't really want to program in it because it's it's too, uh, you know, it's too weak to actually write interesting programs in. I mean, uh, according to the, you know, Church Turing thesis, anything can be written in it, but in practice it would be really hellish. So it turns out that we can carry this program forward to full higher order logic so that instead of just talking about propositions as our types, we can talk about arbitrary uh, logical formulas. And we can extend the lambda calculus to something quite powerful, uh, to, to a full functional programming language. OK, so Haskell is somewhere between what we did and the full Monty of a higher order logic. It's caught in the middle there somewhere. Uh, but Ogda has the full thing. It has all of it. It's a functional programming language in which the types are full higher order uh, logic, in which you can basically express uh, anything that can be done in set theory or, or category theory, up, up to some ca caveats. OK. Further, Ogda's type system is sound, whereas Haskell's type system is unsound. OK. That's, that's actually important if you're interested in using these types that we have as um, specifications for our software. Because if you have an unsound system, you'll be able to prove arbitrary properties about your software as long as your software is non-functional in a certain way, which we'll show in a second. So in Haskell, we can prove any type. Every single type is what we call inhabited. inhabited. And what it means to be inhabited is that you have a proof that there is some program that has that type. OK. So give me any type A, and I can produce a program in Haskell which gives you that type. And this is an, the easiest way to do it. Loop has type A. Loop equals loop. OK. And that, that will work for any type that you come up with. So obviously, if you want to use Ogda as a theorem prover, this would be really problematic, OK? So what did we do wrong? What's, what's wrong with this proof here? Well, this proof is actually circular, and I'll show you in a second. So there's two ways we can avoid coming up with this problem, and that one is that we have, if we have circular proofs, we have to ensure that they either terminate or co-terminate. Otherwise, an infinite proof that's circular that doesn't do one of those two is liable to get us into trouble. OK. So in order to show you this, we're going to have to be a little bit more careful with variables. So I'm going to quickly extend the way we did natural deduction to deal with variable contexts. OK. So here we have the turnstile. We, on the far left, we have a context of free variables. Then we have our program turn term on the right hand side of the turnstile and then we have the type which the program is said to satisfy okay now for our modus ponens we'll extend it so that it's written gamma some uh, context of free variables some program term f and some uh, type a implies b and the application will be written in this way so we have gamma the same free variables F applied to T has type B. OK. So it turns out that infinite or potentially infinite proofs are not unusual at all. And they're absolutely essential to programming in a functional programming language. And the way that it works is essentially as follows. You have a proof. In order to uh, introduce a function that's recursive, what we do is we take the function F, we assume it has type A, and then we try to type check the body of the function. OK? So if this was the case, if f was actually loop, what would happen here is that we'd have loop has type A. We'll take loop, we'll extend our context with loop has type A, and then we'll try to type check that loop has type A. 
and we'll see immediately that that's uh, since we have a free variable in our context of that type, we can conclude that in fact it type checks. So we have an immediate circularity. We've proved A by saying that by assuming A. So we've actually come up against a, a circularity. And that's why Haskell's type system is unsound. Okay, so there's ways around this, but there's no perfect principle to avoid it. So Ogda, Koch, Isabel all have uh, limitations that keep you from getting these circular or infinite proofs uh, in cases where they're unsound. However, there's a problem. Girdle's incompleteness theorem says that uh, that every principle that you try to choose to avoid this problem is either too restrictive and it leaves out good programs that are perfectly fine and uh, you may need them uh, in fact or it's not restrictive enough so you're going to allow some bad programs so uh, that's kind of a conundrum the way that Ogda deals with it is by trying to have a very broad principle for allowing things in that seems to work most of the time and then you can you can actually say that you want to escape the type system and you're allowed to have an arbitrary circularity and it will allow you to do that. Uh, cock, you can do that in cock but you have to add an axiom and that's problematic for other reasons but and the same is true of Isabel. Um, but there's there's no there's essentially no way around this problem. It's a, it's a fundamental problem, and it's related to the full employment theorem, which is that essentially, because of this fact, you can always take the restriction that's too restrictive and extend out the boundary of that restriction, and therefore there's always something for type theorists to do. Okay, that's it. Speaking of recursion. So, any questions? <laughs> I'll take it off the... Uh... There we go. Was that clear enough? <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Stunned silence. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go ahead and end the broadcast then. And uh, if, you, if anybody wants to bring something up, they can. <laughs>